aprendizaje. Thank you. Thank you, Mons, and thank you, Professor Albert, for and EduLab for this fantastic invitation to come to join you in exploring this idea of learning ecologies. Um, I think Mons said, uh, and it's very important, that how you look at something depends on the perspectives of where you've come from, the context in which you're working. And my context is not um, looking exclusively at the technological sense of ecology, it's, it's more about a sort of holistic learning sense of ecology. So that's what my remarks will be directed to that. Okay, so in natural ecological systems, they comprise lots of organic material, organisms, uh, within some sort of environment, so they're residents of a habitat, interacting with the environment and interacting with each other. Um, so that's a natural ecosystem, and each organism in that ecosystem um, has its own e ecology, very specific to the organism. And the same is true of human beings. And I've drawn very heavily on the work of Jay Lemke, a uh, sociologist um, and cultural social theorist in America. Um, and he's provided a lot of insights which I think I've tried to work with in my own particular context. In your, in your um, little green pamphlet, there's um, a little handout, two-page handout, which I'm going to use because... An ecology is very much a relational concept. It's that one with the coloured colored picture on it. It's very much a relational concept with lots of things in it. So, so it's easy to get lost when you try to explain something. So I, I think in pictures, so I've made a picture to, to sort of relate to it. So what is an ecology then? Well, I, I see it as um, a learning ecology is about an individual first and foremost. It's, it's you and me acting in our environment, um, trying to do something, so we have a purpose, it's an intentional action to learn. And it's to do with all our relationships and all our interactions in pursuing that purpose. So it's individual, environment, intent, and relationships, they're all part of that, of that process. And it grows from the circumstances of individuals' lives. So it's not, so my learning ecologies don't have much to do with your lives. They have to do with my individual life, my context, my purposes. So if, you, if we look at the little picture there, I've drawn a blue line around a lot of words and some little action pictures. And that blue line represents a temporally and spatially bounded space within which the ecology unfolds. That ecology is linked to past ecologies, and it's also going to be linked in the future, although we don't know how that will be linked. So within that sort of temporally bounded space then, the person is at the heart of it. As I said, the person has purpose. They need to achieve something. They need to do something. And that drives, that is, provides the motivation for them to create an ecology. They're going to have to put a lot of effort into it, a lot of creativity, a lot of intellectual uh, demand if it's a very complex thing. So that person brings all sorts of things to the ecology, their capabilities, or knowledge from past experiences of how they're going to learn, approach this, um, their character. So their will and determination to achieve something is fundamental to a learning ecology. And I'm talking specifically about self-determined learning ecologies, not an ecology that I fit into because someone else has designed, but an ecology which I myself am going to create for my purposes. So, so person is at the heart of that. Now that person within their environment, the circumstance of their life, can see affordance. I can see how my purposes can be served by <coughs> acting in this way, seeing the action potential within the environment. Um, and they will also... Um, create for themselves some sort of space. Now, I don't just mean a physical space like this one. I mean mental space. So ecologies are driven by a sense of inquiry, a sense of, I want to find out, I want to discover something. Um, so that notion of, of transition, going from a state of understanding that I know, I know to, into areas where I don't know, is very much part and parcel of a learning ecology. Um, within that ecology, I will be forming all sorts of relationships. Relationships with people are particularly important because they often provide you with the knowledge resources that you need. 
But relationship with objects and things in the environment, mediating tools, for example, technologies, will be there as part of that, as, as part of that process. Um, the context, as I said right at the start, is everything to do with your environment and the perspectives you're bringing to the situation, the challenges and your purposes. Uh, resources, well, essentially knowledge resources, we're looking for all sorts of knowledges. We're looking for, obviously, codified knowledge, but often that doesn't take us very far. We have to tap into the embodied knowledge of individuals in our environment in order to progress our thinking. Um, but the resources also includes the technologies and the tools that we use to find the knowledge and then to process and work with that knowledge. So this is, I think, where the, to the tools and technologies are particularly important. And then our processes are the things that bind everything together. So we have a sense of where we want to go, a vision, uh, if you like, a plan to get there. And that plan will change. It's a very messy process, isn't it, learning uh, quite difficult things. Um, so I, coming back to the person again, underlying this idea of a, of a self-determined ecology is this fundamental process of self-regulation. So I imagine, I have a purpose, I imagine how I'm going to satisfy that purpose, I, I cr create some sort of plans, these are the steps I need to, to get there, I act, I adjust my plans if things don't work out, and then towards the end I can start reflecting on that experience and making sense of it and, and creating new sorts of learning through the meaning-making process that will then feed into the future. So that, in a sense, is, is, a, is, is, is a fundamental, um, if you like, a learning process that goes on. And then the final thing I will say is creativity. I think learning ecologies actually are the host for our creativity. When you think about it, creating something as awesome as a learning ecology is an inherently creative process. You're bringing into existence the means by which you are going to discover and find new things. And it seems to me that we, we, we don't recognise that, really. And I think for higher education it would be great, wouldn't it, if we can recognise that fundamentally we're creative because of the processes that we build in order to discover things. How am I doing for time? One minute. One minute, OK. <laughs> Over the page, there's some notes which just back up what I've been saying. Um, but on the third page... <laughs> The third page shows a, a map of the, um, my learning ecology for this seminar. We'll forget that because I'll talk about it in the presentation. And then on the final page, because this is about lifelong learning ecologies, I just wanted to give you um, a sort of impression of the way I think it works. As we progress through our life, and I'll be talking about life-wide learning next, um, we're building all sorts of ecologies. They're overlapping, they're running simultaneously. So as you, as you go over time, you will see any number of learning ecologies, some of which will connect, some of which will, be, will not connect. Um, and in a sense, we never know where a learning ecology will connect to next. We can only do that when we get there, and we can think, oh, I remember. I remember something important from that, from that past ecology. What can I do with it now? So that's the way I think it works. Thank okay, you. Okay, thank you very much. Now, now Rose Lukin from the Institute of Thank Education. Thank you. <coughs> and hello. Yeah, I'm Rose Lukin, and it's really delightful to follow Norman because he's done a lot of the groundwork for me, so that's <laughs> very, very helpful. So I came to thinking about learning ecologies because as I was doing empirical studies with teachers and learners, I noticed that the circumstances or the conditions in which learning took place made a huge amount of difference to the kinds of learning interactions that occurred. So you could be using exactly the same resource, a video for example, and yet the circumstances in which your learners viewed that video make a big difference to the way in which they learn through that video. For example, the different people that they interact with as they're watching the video can make a big difference. And I wanted to understand more about these circumstances and conditions, or as I would put it, the context of learning. So it was through exploring what we mean by learning context. Many writers tell us that learning context makes a big impact on learning, but what do we mean by learning context? It was through trying to understand more about learning context that I came across the notion of an ecology of learning. So for me, an ecology is a way of talking about 
the learner's context. And the kind of ecology that I deal with is what I would call an ecology of resources, which actually I think is very similar to what Norman was talking about. So as a learner, one is experiencing different kinds of resources all the time. So I'm standing here in this room. There are lots of people I've not met before, some people I have met before. I've got my phone, I can access the internet. There are physical aspects to this room. There are protocols. It would be very strange if I now walked out the door and didn't come back for 10 minutes because that's not <laughs> what you would expect. So there are ways of engaging in this kind of circumstance. And all of these become part of my context. But along with Norman, I don't see it as something I move in and out of. My context is something that's my lived experience of the world. It's a sum total of all of the interactions I have with resources as I pass through the world. And today is just a snapshot in that experience. So it's a very complex, messy concept. And I find the idea of an ecology of resources offers me a way to talk about the complex concept of context when I'm trying to design appropriate resources and appropriate interactions for learners and teachers. So as an educator, I see it as my role to try and help learners <coughs> pull together the most suitable resources to support their learning. And then once they've pulled together those resources, it's my role to help them interact with those resources in a way that supports their learning. And underpinning this notion of the ecology of resources is a particular philosophy of learning which is that belonging to Vygotsky, who saw learning as a process of interaction. So you learn through your interactions in the world, and those interactions become internalized. And it's that process of internalization that's important for the process of learning and developing. So as an educator, the kind of ways in which I need to support the learner's interactions with their resources are the ways in which I can support that process of internalization. So it's underpinned by a particular theory about learning. One last point about this, which I'll talk about more later, is that as we interact in the world as learners, we don't have unfettered access to the resources that we come across. As I said earlier, there's an expectation that I will stand here and talk for about another four minutes because that's what it says on the program and that's what it's reasonable for you to expect, not that I'll disappear. And so there are ways in which our access to resources are filtered. They're not direct. It would be inappropriate for me to come up to the gentleman sitting on the end and say, oh, can you just tell me a bit about Barcelona now because I have not been here for a while and, and I'd like to know some more because that's not what's expected. It's not always possible to access the internet because maybe we haven't got a connection. It's not possible for a child to always access the teacher because there are other children who also need to access the teacher. So there is this notion of filters that stand between the learner and the resources that can help them with their learning and impact on the interactions that they can have. And sometimes as educators, it's our role to actually put filters in place. Sometimes, for example, a child learning or an adult learning needs to be slowed down. They can't deal with all the possible pieces of information at the same time, so we need to organise that information, perhaps into a curriculum, for example, or perhaps into a narrative. So filters can be positive. They can be ways in which we help 
learners to interact with the resources that are available to them. But they can also be negative. They can be barriers that are put up in order to control a particular situation that are not helpful to learners. And in that situation, we might want to think about how we break those barriers down as an educator. So for example, technology gives us the possibility to communicate with people across different time zones, across different physical locations, but often we as humans put barriers in the way of that communication because it's not convenient for somebody commu to communicate at this particular moment in time. So we might want to think in a school situation why we have particular timetables. In an online environment, we don't have those constraints. But what constraints do we have? What constraints do get put in the way of the person interacting with the resources? And there are there ways as educators that we need to break down those filters. So filters can be both negative and positive. And in addition to identifying appropriate resources, supporting appropriate interactions, we as educators need to look at those filters and think how best those filters can be dealt with. And I'm going to stop there. Thank you. OK, Hand thank up. you very much. <laughs> now, Caroline, uh, University of British Columbia, Canada. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Good, good morning, all. Um, please, uh, I, I know I have a long last name. Caroline is fine. <laughs> please do call me Caroline. <laughs> Um, I, uh, when I think of learning ecologies, uh, I think not of the classroom or even of the educational institution or in the context, but of the, that wider impact of the internet on who learns what, from whom, where, and under what circumstances, and via which means, face-to-face -face or technology uh, supported. So my, my focus is not really on, on how a new technology disrupts or transforms or even challenges the student in the classroom, or even the teacher in relation to the students, but how the transformation happens from, open, from closed to open learning. How those leaky boundaries of the class, they mention that whether you can or cannot get into the internet, and how many of you are on the internet right now? A few, I hope so. You're tweeting, I hope. <laughs> Did you have a hashtag? <laughs> yes. It's that leaky boundary, right? So how does that affect uh, the information, um, the, 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 all those things, the, the tutorials, the learning aids, videos, conversations, etc. How do all those that are available on the internet affect learning? And then how does this disrupt and transform and challenge the role of the student, who now has a lot more responsibility for their learning environment, and the role of the teacher who has to work in this open environment? And how do these combine to open up new ways of knowledge creation and knowledge building rather than knowledge transfer. Something you probably all don't think about learning as a knowledge transfer, but I'm constantly surprised how much uh, that is still an idea that, uh, that you're up here to transfer information. And of course, standing up here talking, again, is not the, the best way to demonstrate that leaky boundary. I should be having internet feeds, uh, the questions in the background, et cetera. All that opening up the classroom. So when I was thinking about this, I was thinking about, I was thinking maybe I could try and make a PowerPoint slide. That didn't happen. But if you think about the closed building, the, uh, the silo idea, uh, just something that's square, even, even this room as the closed environment, and thought, well, how do you expand that to an ecology? Well, let's start thinking about it as an island with shores, uh, with land, with sea ecologies. And then we're thinking in that sense that's like groups, teams, organizations, institutions. And then, because I'm a network person, I think, well, actually, it's more like an archipelago a string of islands. And so we have them as a network of islands connected by sea routes. Um, you have uh, the issues of building those networks, uh, building those sea works, determining political boundaries, and reconfiguring land for ports and the like. So how does all that openness, the connectedness, change what we're doing? I think in some sense it changes the questions we ask about learning. The wonderful idea about the colleges is it changes how we're thinking about things. Um, really going from the kind of idea of school-based learning to lifelong learning to anywhere, anytime learning. Uh, but a couple of uh, ways of learning that came from some interviews with teachers was the just-in-time learning and more importantly, the in-as-much-time-as-I-have learning. So I want to add from, to, to, to take the 
um, what we know about learning and add to that. So for, to structuring a class, you want to add complexity, the complexity of the class. From individual learning, add network to learning. To individual knowledge building, add community-based knowledge building. And to community learning and knowledge construction, add crowds. And I will talk a bit more about this later. Crowd learning, crowdsourcing knowledge. So when we think about ecologies, we should also go back to picking up some ideas from environmental psychology, particularly the work of Gibson on the affordances. What does the environment afford? Uh, what does it allow to happen? Uh, closed doors don't allow for participation from outside. But of course, when you've got the internet here, you have, it affords participation from people who are not here. Uh, there's participation for people later in time when this is, vid when this is recorded. So we're opening up the possibilities uh, of what's actually afforded starting from a lecture like this. So my colleague Richard Andrews talks about the co-evolutionary model of information technologies and learning. So also we open up the idea of thinking about uh, how each is affecting the other. And he talks about this in the concepts of literacy. So what does it mean to be literate in today's society? What's the ecology of literacy and how is that changing with the technologies? And then how do we change the technologies to to, to increase our literacies and vice versa. They're co-evolving. And that's, that's a psychology aspect, it's an ecology aspect. Um, so also, um, Robin Goodfellow and Mary Lee also addressed this about literacy in the digital university, emphasizing the socio-material. This is a word they know. So how does the material, the physical objects, affect the social interactions? Again, when we have lines of chairs, we are, we are bound to connections with the people who are right beside us, right behind us. It's, it's different from uh, what can be afforded by everybody sitting around at a table, at a circle. It, um. So I, really, as I said, I want to take that uh, silo aspect and build on that, um, take the transfer uh, metaphor, moving on from the transfer metaphor, moving on from a teaching metaphor, even moving on from a curriculum metaphor where there's some knowledge authority that says what what's going to be learned onto uh, a more open concept. So we uh, have, I just, you know, we think about Internet 1, Internet 2, Internet 3. So we've had um, Internet 1, which was basically our transfer of content. Everybody had to have a web page. Well, that was perhaps also the first stages of e-learning where everybody had to put the course online and I know we're seeing it again in the MOOCs. Now the other thing to think about is, these, is that there's different stages of readiness. So not everybody is ready to do the most advanced use of technologies. And in, in every instance now, we're gonna see a shading of people who are able to, to take on, as teachers and as students, different stages of that. So when I say that, it, the, the, that it's e-learning 1.0 to put content online, it's, it's still gonna be seen even now, and it's still a component of what you have to do in that, that area. Um, so uh, what, we have there we started struggling with ideas of contact hours. Um, we told the other day that contact hours, uh, when we first did an online classes in 1996, the face-to-face -face was three hours. Well, what's an hour online? <laughs> so we did two hours of live, and one hour was supposed to be covered through the discussion during the week. But it took an institutional change to accept that as an equivalent unit to three hours. So even we're changing the units of uh, consideration. And that 1.0 started really to changing our, our consideration of units. What's asynchronous mean? And that's a big, really big change, a very disrupting of the, the technology and the, the ecosystem. Internet 2, participatory culture. So in, in two, you're learning 2.2, 2.0, we're really looking at collaborative learning, uh, participatory culture uh, learning movement, uh, with words and concepts that stress emerging participatory effects such as co-construction of knowledge, knowledge building communities, conversation. So again, instead of the lecture being the main thing, it's the interaction that is happening. And again, this is always happening in good teaching, but really with the 2.0, it became possible to do much more of that through the technologies as well. So now we're moving up to Internet 3.0 and e-learning 3.0. Now, now, what do we expect from that? Uh, I've got words like post-human, big data, data mining, computational science, algorithmic response, something I was just reading about the other day, algorithmic responses to manage your email for you. Yes. Peer-to-peer uh, -peer computing in the social realm. What are these going to be? 
So right now we're in the transfer stage again, transferring information to mobile devices, including Google Glass. It may be a revolutionary technology, but it's not a revolutionary learning technology except for the mobility aspects. Uh, transferring monitoring functions from humans to the Internet of Things. We think of our smart appliances. We can now monitor our, our refrigerator or our stoves from uh, far away. Well, not in my house, but others can do it. <laughs> so we're seeing in the analyses uh, the human interpretation of big data and particularly visualization. Another area we're going to have to start thinking about it and, and how to teach, learn, and work with visualizations of the quantities of data that we can't actually interpret as humans. But as humans, we can see and understand the patterns in the data better than machines at the moment. So uh, this, we're not really into that much, but we're beginning to get some work in that in the learning analytics area. So the best scenario I see is a significant harnessing of, the, of human computation. Again, a fluid dynamic of human and computational skills such as already appearing in science crowdsourcing initiatives. And you may know things like um, uh, Galaxy Zoo, where humans are better at identifying in the star pictures what is a galaxy than, than computers are. The algorithms at this point not been worked out. So here we have human computation. Um, uh, and including in the learning ecology, not just the receipt of information and visualizations, but contribution to crowdsourcing, some kind of joint human computation knowledge co-production, uh, a little bit emerging in the visual analytics area, and to see in the future a social harnessing of not just the individual at their machine, but a joint human social computation. So these are the kind of ideas of the ecology, and I'm going to, to leave it there, uh, but really we're trying to think about where things have gone from, from closed to open and, this, and massively open in more than just uh, a, a MOOC <laughs> course context, but a massively open that everything is open and flowing. And we'll be sort of laying out the, the picking and choosing. We almost need much more to understand the context and the individual learning environment because there is so much more that we're going to be working with. And I will leave it with you there. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much.